Welcome back. In the last lesson, we started over CISSP Chapter 2 on Personnel Security and Risk Management. We covered the personality or the personnel security policies and procedures. And in this lecture, we're going to cover applying risk management concepts. This lecture is going to be a bit long and it's going to involve some math. So I want you to be prepared before we get started. So first, I want to cover just really quickly covering the topics of what is going to be covered in this in this lecture. There's a lot in here. First, we're going to talk about some basic terminology of risk. Then we're going to talk about quantitative analysis of risk, which includes asset valuations and threat vulnerabilities and then risk assessment related to quality or quantitative things that can be counted. Then we're going to talk about qualitative, which is going to be a little bit more difficult to understand. It's, it's more subjective, things that cannot be defined, like what is your reputation and what is the influence and how do we know it isn't a direct dollar amount. It's more of a subjective valuation, but there is still risk involved. We're going to find two different ways to be able to document our risk management through this chapter, and then we'll talk about how we're going to apply responses controls, countermeasures, monitoring, so on and so forth. We're going to doc talk about the documentations that you're going to need to do, how we can make those better, and then, of course, the risk frameworks that we use from um, the NIST frameworks. So let's get started. So first and foremost, we need to understand what the words mean. There are a lot of words that we're going to be using in risk management as we go through. So first, an asset. An asset is anything used in a business process or task. It can be a person, place, or thing, anything that the business relies on. So it can be an employee specifically. It can be a piece of hardware. It can be a location, the building itself. It can also be unvaluable things like, or in, in, it can be things that are harder to describe, like your reputation or the image that people have of you in the outside world. Once we define our asset, we need to figure out what is it worth. Assign an actual dollar amount to that asset. It sounds a little bit harsh. What is the value of a person? Well, we need to understand that so we can understand the risk management and the solutions that we're going to choose to handle those risks. Then we come up with a threat. A threat is anything that causes an undesirable outcome. It can cause damage, it can be loss, it can be disclosure of information, blocked access, intentional or unintentional. Threats are not always intentional. Sometimes things just happen. Then we have who are the threat actors or the threat agents. These are the people, systems, or programs that intentionally exploit your vulnerabilities. So a threat being someone breaking into your system would be maybe a program or um, something along those lines, an outside system coming in. The event, the threat event, is the actual exploitation of the vulnerability. This could be a hurricane. This could be insider trading. This could be somebody spills coffee on a network and blows it up. I mean, this is the actual thing that occurred. The vector the threat vector is the means of the attack. If you spilled the coffee, the coffee is now the means of the attack. If it was somebody installing malware, the malware is the means of the attack. It can be your email, a drive, a network, physical access, the mobile device, clouds, so social media, supply chains, media in general, and commercial software. Any of these can be a vector to be able to carry out the attack or the threat event. A vulnerability is what we call a weakness of an asset or the weakness with of, or the absence of a safeguard or countermeasure. Essentially, it is a flaw or a loophole or limitation or frailty or susceptibility of the asset. You have a building and you leave the door unlocked. That is a vulnerability. You have a person who, for whatever reason, has some sort of a flaw or frailty that can be a threat um, weakness, so it can be a vulnerability. And the last one in this description is exposure, which is simply the act of being susceptible to a loss because of a threat. We're going to be discussing the exposure factor as we go along with our calculations, but it's essentially the chance that an event is going to happen. 
How likely is it that you're going to spill coffee on your keyboard? How likely is it that a hurricane is going to hit? Well, if you're in a place that doesn't have hurricanes, probably not very likely. But if you're in Hurricane Alley and they happen all the time, it might be something you might want to be prepared for. To handle that, we need to understand a safeguard is any type of a security control or protection mechanism or a countermeasure that we're going to implement to make that vulnerability a little bit less, decrease the weakness, decrease the exposure, decrease the chance that that threat is going to occur. The attack is an intentional, this has to be intentional to be an attack, attempted exploitation of a vulnerability by a threat agent to cause damage. The difference between a threat event and an attack means that the attack was intentional. Somebody, some threat agent, could be person, place, or, or you know, people, program, or systems, but something attacked with the intention to cause damage. They intended this, as opposed to a hurricane. A hur hurricane didn't intend to cause damage. It has no, no personality. And then there is a breach. A breach is any type of intrusion or penetration, some sort of security mechanism bypassed by the threat agent. Somebody broke in. That is a breach. So when we talk about a breach, a breach is somebody actively breaking in. An attack is an intentional attack. And our safeguards are the things we do to try to prevent the attack from happening. Anything we can do to try to prevent somebody from getting in and actually causing damage to our system. So then let's talk about risk. Risk, as a definition, is the possibility or likelihood that a threat will exploit a vulnerability for the purposes of causing harm. So if we take our threat and we multiply it by our vulnerability, we end up with our risk. How vulnerable are you to this threat? You can also think of it as the probability of the harm and the severity of the harm. How likely is it that something bad is going to happen and how bad is it when it does? So we have to think of things in actual numbers to quantify them or in terms so that we can figure out what are the high risks, what are the low risks, which ones do we need to mitigate, which ones can we absorb, how are we going to handle it. And we look through things through this cycle of risk. You can honestly start the cycle of risk at any point. But let's start at the top. A threat. Somebody wants to exploit the vulnerabilities. So there's a vulnerability. By exploiting the vulnerability, we end up with exposure. So the exposure being that a threat was able to be exposed through a vulnerability. The exposure results in risk. The way we mitigate our risk is with safeguards, some sort of a control, which protect our assets, and our assets are endangered by our threats. And everything goes around in a circle again. So you can start with assets. What are our assets? What are the threats that expose our assets? Which vulnerabilities work with the threats? And so on and so forth. You can start with the risk. You can start with vulnerabilities. You can start with safeguards. It doesn't really matter where you start. You end up with the entire cycle as you go through it. Recognizing that you have to have an asset and that asset has to be endangered by a threat, which is going to exploit the vulnerability in the asset, which results in the exposure, which is the risk that we're talking about, which is mitigated by safeguards, which protect the assets. The safeguards are the important part of mitigating our risk. Mitigating meaning to try to find a way to make it so that the risk isn't so bad. So if I have um, a backup of my data and my data gets stolen or my computer crashes, computer crashing is a risk. It's not an intentional risk as in somebody broke my system, but it's something that can happen. I have to be aware of the possibility of my computer's hard drive dying. I have a backup which mitigates that risk so that when my computer breaks, I can buy a new computer, reinstall the backup, and now I have all of my data back. Finding ways to use safeguards to mitigate our risk, recognizing the risk occurred in the first place. You always have to be aware of the risk. You have a risk when you get in your car and you drive down the street. You know that you could be hit by another car, therefore you mitigate it by wearing your seatbelt, by buying insurance, different ways of mitigating your risk. You recognize that there is a risk at any moment in your life that something bad could happen. Recognizing what those bad things are what could happen 
And how can you mitigate it? How can you make sure that the damage inflicted therein is not as bad as it could have been? That is your cycle of risk. So now we need to start with our asset valuation. We have to figure out what is each asset worth. And I know it sounds terrible to put a number or a dollar amount on things like people and reputation, but you can. The asset is anything that we value for the continuation of the organization. If you had company A and you found out that company A was putting, I don't know, brake fluid in their sodas, um, you probably would stop buying drinks from company A. That reputation, whether it was true or not, the reputation of how good their product is, is part of an asset valuation. It is worth something to the company, just as much as the computers and the servers and the people that are involved, reputation is something we need to think about. So we need to identify the asset's worth so that we know how much money we need to spend to protect it. There is no reason to spend $1,000 protecting a $10 part. Just go buy another $10 part. Unless, of course, you can't go buy another $10 part, which means it might be worth $1,000 to protect it. We need to assign a value to all of our assets because we need to be able to do cost-benefit analysis of protection. We need to find the cost and effectiveness of our safeguards. We need it for insurance purposes to determine its worth. We need to understand what's at risk, and we need to be in compliance to prevent negligence. This is kind of a, a, an interesting one for most people to think about, the compliance issue. Most people get the concept of, if it's a $10 part, do I need $1,000 to replace it? What is it worth? That all kind of makes sense. But there are also rules and regulations enforced by governments to ensure that certain things have to occur. Like literally, your company gets fined or shut down if it doesn't do these things. If there is negligence found that you chose not to protect this risk, even though you knew it was an option, there can be huge consequences therein. So how do we determine an asset's value? A whole lot of things. Everything in involved in the list below is included in the possible things that does contribute to your asset value. How much did it cost? How much did it cost to make? How much does it cost to manage? How much does it cost to maintain or upkeep? How much did it cost to protect or sustain it? What is its personal value to the owners or the users? What is its value to the competitors? What is the intellectual property? What is the market valuation? How much does it cost to replace it? Sometimes a replacement is an okay option. That may be a mitigation you can choose, but how much does that cost? How much does it decrease your productivity? If you're running a line of cars and you're manufacturing cars and a part breaks and your entire line has to shut down for three days, how much productivity did you lose? How much in, um, enhancement or degradation did you have in your productivity when something bad happens? If the people on your work floor are demoralized or in some way injured, how much is that going to decrease your productivity? your operational costs of an asset's presence or loss. So if you lose the asset, what is the operational cost that, that's involved? What is the liability of the asset loss? This gets into like PII. If you lose control of personal information, there is a financial liability that goes along with that. How useful is that asset? And what is the relationship to research and development? So you may not have this product in production yet, but it may be part of your R&D and that may be a loss as well. As you can see, there's huge things that contribute to assets value. You get to decide what these are. This is where you get into a room with a lot of people and you guys start discussing how much is this worth. It is very rarely a single number answer. It's usually a lot of things mixed together to figure out what is that asset worth. If you go buy a new computer, say the computer is, I don't know, $500 for a brand new computer. Okay, how much is the computer worth to you? Well, that depends. It could be worth $500, which is how much it would cost you to replace it. But if you have pictures on that computer that you can't get back, what are those worth? Are those worth $1,000? Are they worth $10,000? Is it worth saving? If you have an engagement ring that was your grandmother's engagement ring that you've had appraised at $500, it may be worth a whole lot more than that to you because of its personal attachment. Asset value is very, very rarely easily defined. It usually involves discussions and conversations and how do you define this, but somebody has to come up with a number. Someone has to throw a number out and say, what about this? Does that sound appropriate? And someone else has to go yes or no. 
So once we come up with our assets, we need to start looking at our threat sources and our threat events. What are the things that could happen to damage that asset? Now that I have my list of assets, now your list of assets could be five items long, 20 items long, 100 items long. It's it's difficult to give a quantitative number of how many assets you have. Your people, the individual people, the groups of people, the furniture, the building itself, the computers, lots of assets involved. Each one of those has a possible threat against it. Say you have a stellar programmer that you're so excited to hire on. What is the risk of him getting hit by a truck? What is the risk of him winning the lottery and flying to Jamaica and leaving you? So you need to think about the different things that could occur you can have adversarial and non-adversarial threat sources or threat events. So your threat sources can be adversarial. Somebody, some person, an individual, a group, an organization doesn't like you and they want to do something bad to you. That's a threat source. You can have accidental from a person, a user, an administrator, somebody accidentally leaving their computer open, leaving their computer at Starbucks and having somebody else get hold of it. It wasn't on purpose, but it's an accidental threat source. You can have structural, the equipment fails, that happens, software fails, environmental, hurricane, flood, and you can have an environmental, natural or man-made, infrastructure outrage, outages, failures, the power goes down, again, um, EMP, pla EMP blasts that are going to cause, you know, some sort of radiation. I mean, these are things that can occur, environmental, natural or man-made, so even things like energy, that we expect energy to work all the time, what happens if it's out? What happens if the internet's out? These lists are not exa exhaustive. They are just a couple of examples. From the threat events, there are adversarial and non-adversarial. Again, adversarial meaning that we don't like each other. So somebody doesn't like you. There can be reconnaissance, there can be attacks, there can be malicious capabilities, there's exploits, direct attacks, getting results, coordinated campaigns. Essentially, they're, they're out to get you. They want to get something from you. But you can also have non-adversarial threat events, like, again, natural disasters, physical dis device failures, incorrect privilege set settings that were just done accidentally, communication failure, you thought you were supposed to do something and you weren't, and things like power outages. None of these are done intentional. The NIST framework up here, the 380, has a link to this, which runs through a couple of lists of threat sources and threat events. This is a great resource when you are trying to come up with what threats or what events could possibly occur in my situation. Again, not exhaustive. They're just examples, but it gives you a way to start looking at your assets and how they could be attacked. Where is the vulnerability? Where is the negative if something bad happens to this asset? So the first part of our risk assessment, we are going to start dealing with numbers. If you're not a numbers person, it's okay. You can always use calculator, and there's different ways of being able to use programs to design this. But you need to understand what the numbers mean, and they are usually referenced by variables like AV and EF and SLE. So understanding what those letters, those acronyms stand for, will help you to figure out how to do the math to figure out what the analysis is. So quantitative, being able to quantify or put into numbers, assigns a real dollar amount to the loss. We actually use math with this to determine what safeguards we should use based on how much do we actually have risked. The first is our valuation. What is the dollar amount assigned to our asset? Once we know what the dollar amount is, we figure out what our exposure factor is. What is the percentage of loss if a single asset were compromised by a single risk? So if I have a computer and my computer's hard drive goes out, what is the loss? Well, in theory, I could go buy a new hard drive for maybe $100, put the new hard drive in my computer, and I've only lost 20% of my $500 computer. So the effective exposure factor is only 20% of losing my hard drive. Now, spilling, keep spilling coffee on my motherboard and blowing my motherboard, that might be a little bit more. I might have 100% loss on that. So how much of the asset is going to be lost if this risk were to happen? If I have a building and there's an earthquake, is the building going to get totaled by an earthquake or is the building just going to have a little bit of structural damage? If I get into a car accident, what are the options of my car getting totaled and what are the actual options of my accident just being minor damage? So you come up with a percentage. Again, we give it a real number, but 
those are numbers that you're kind of pulling out of thin air. You're trying to find a way to describe how you got to that exposure factor. As long as you can justify it to yourself and to the team, then it makes sense. Once we have our asset value and our exposure factor, we multiply them together to come up with the single loss expectancy. How much is it going to cost for a single loss of this single risk? So if I have one computer that I lose one hard drive on that is a $500 computer asset value times a 20% um, exposure factor means that my potential loss of my hard drive dying is going to be $100. $500 times 20% is $100. My SLE is $100 at this point. Once we take that, we go down to our annualized rate of occurrence. How many times per year do you expect to have your hard drive break? Well, I've been pretty lucky with hard drives. So I probably have one die every, I don't know, five years or maybe every 10 years. So if I look at that, I would say it's a 10% chance or a 0.1 chance that in any given year, I am going to have this hard drive break. So my ARO is 0.1 or 10%. That ARO can be more than one. It can be 20. How many times do you expect to spill coffee on a keyboard in a company of 10,000 people? I'm expecting probably 100 per year. That's fine. Your ARO in that case would be 100. How many times do you think it's going to happen per year? So it can be a decimal. It can be a fraction. It can be a percentage. It can also be a whole number, and it can literally go up to infinity. I think this is going to happen literally every day. Every single day, we are going to get attacked by spam. So I need to handle this every single day. So your ARO is a number that defines how often this is going to occur per year. Per year is the important part. Because then we're going to take our single loss equivalency or expectancy, and we're going to multiply it by our ARO, our annualized rate of occurrence, to figure out how much we expect to lose per year based on this asset and this risk. So this asset, my hard drive, this risk of having my hard drive die, I am expecting 10.1 times 100 or $10. My ALE is $10. That's how much I expect to lose per year due to this threat with no mitigation. Because again, my hard drives don't fail very often. Spilling coffee, it might be $5,000 per year is how much you expect to lose because of spilling coffee on your keyboards and having to replace the keyboards. We can use that ALE, that annualized loss expectancy, to determine how much should we spend per year to prevent this from happening, to mitigate this risk. If the risk of this is huge, $100,000 a year, $10,000 a year, a million dollars a year, those safeguards that we put in are going to make more sense because the cost-benefit analysis, the countermeasures, makes it worth it. So that is quantitative. Qualitative is subjective. It's intangible. It's based on feelings and perceptions and intuition and your preferences. If you like apples as opposed to oranges, you will pay more for apples than oranges. If you don't like oranges, you won't buy them for anything. It's all about your personal preferences and your feelings and your company and, and what is important to you. When we do qualitative analysis, we look at each asset and threat together and we determine whether or not they are identified as high, medium, or low as in terms of how likely are they going to happen and how bad is it if it does. So there is a balancing act that we're going to do here a little bit further along when we get into our documentation of, of matrixing or essentially looking at the possibility of something happen, the likelihood against its, its damage that is done to figure out if this risk-threat pairing is a high, medium, or low? What are the chances that this is going to happen? And how bad is it if it does? To do this, we are gonna usually involve a team. We're gonna do some brainstorming. We're gonna do storyboarding. We're gonna do focus groups and surveys and questionnaires, one-on-one -on -one meetings, interviews, and scenarios. The one example here that most people don't know about is called the Delphi technique. Problem that runs into these brainstorming things is you usually have someone who's of upper management or maybe your boss is in the room and your boss says, I think this is a really bad thing. And a lot of the people in the room go, okay, the boss said so, we'll just do that. The Delphi technique tries to mitigate that by allowing a anonymous feedback response 
um, scenario. Everybody writes down what they think it is. It all goes into a pool. They look at it. They count it all up and they say, okay, 10 people in the room thought that it was a high risk and 10 people thought it was a medium risk. Let's talk about it a little bit more and let's go ahead and try again. And let's, you know, put in different numbers and we'll let you guys keep voting until we can come up with a consensus. The point of this is to include the whole range of people from your C-suite, from your CEO, CFO, CIO, all the way down to your end users from every department and let them all have a say in the matter. Delphi technique is a great technique to get over the um, concern about challenging your boss or about speaking out in front of a crowd and being thought that you were wrong because everything's anonymous, nobody knows you did it, and it kind of gets over that. Um, it also reduces the possibility that some opinions are being discounted or given more influence based on their position in the company rather than the actual valuation of the opinion. So for qualitative, this is how we usually come through it. And we usually identify the risk for, or the, the asset threat pairing risk as high, medium, or low, or sometimes on a scale of one to 10. We need to prioritize and categorize these risks so that we know, again, which ones do we need to mitigate? If we're not worried about social reputation and social media, then we don't need to have a mitigation for that. Whereas if social media could ruin our reputation and that could be a bad thing, then we probably need to come up with a result or some sort of mitigation or um, control that will help that. So let's talk about how to respond to those risks. So we've talked about having actual dollar amounts and we've talked about having high, medium, and low risks. The inherent risk is the natural default risk that occurs naturally. You haven't done anything to fix it yet. So I have a building. What is the risk that bad people are gonna come into my building? I don't know, am I in a high crime area? Then it's probably pretty high. Okay, what if I put a fence around my building? Ooh. Now I take my inherent risk or my total risk and I remove some of that risk with a control. The control risk is the, or the, the controls gap is the risk that's removed due to the response. So we're going to have a response, which leaves us with the residual risk. Inherent risk minus the risk that's removed gives you back the residual, how much is left after you have applied the control. However, you always have to be aware of the idea that there is also a control risk, which is the risk that is introduced by the use of the countermeasure. If I'm going to have guards, I now have a control risk of what if the guard is corrupt? So that's always an option that you want to think about as well. So think about the different types of risk and the good risk and then remove some risk and end up with a residual risk, so on and so forth. So our response options, there are six different ways that we can handle our risk. We can mitigate the risk. Reduce it using safeguards, controls, countermeasures. This is usually the direction we try to go into. We can transfer the risk, what we call assignment. This is insurance or outsourcing. If I have insurance that is going to cover the difference of ransomware, there is such a thing as ransomware insurance. If I get ransomware, the insurance is going to cover the million dollar ransomware. Cool, I'm transferring the risk. I don't have to handle ransomware anymore because it's handled by my insurance company. It's assigned to someone else. Deterrence is the idea of a t convincing someone not to attack. Again, auditing, security cameras, big, huge signs that say, don't go here, you know, dog going to bite you, something, security guards. Different ways of convincing someone not to attack you is a deterrent. Deterrence is about that convincing them for whatever reason. Avoidance. We can choose to do something different. We can choose to have our building in the middle of Hurricane Alley or not. If we don't have it there, we don't have to risk a hurricane, so we've avoided that hurricane risk. We can choose something else. We can fly instead of driving, although flying introduces its own version of control risk. Um, but we can do that instead of driving. We can attend virtually instead of in person. We can use different suppliers. We can not use the product at all. And that way we can avoid the risk associated with using that product. So avoiding the risk means choosing something else. Acceptance, which happens quite frequently, is simply deciding it's worth the risk. Again, if I'm going to blow a hard drive and the annual cost is going to be $10, I don't care. I've, I've decided if I blow my hard drive, I will pay the money and it'll be fine. I'm not going to worry about it. It's worth the risk. I'm okay. Literally, we choose to accept the consequences if this risk actually happens. 
Generally, if you accept it, you want to include a written statement explaining the cost and benefit and why you chose to accept it. Safeguards cost more than the loss was. Therefore, it wasn't worth it. To, to protect this, we'd need $1,000 and it was a $100 product. It wasn't worth the cost. That's accepting. We accept the risk. But we still identified it and we still recognized it was a risk that could happen and we accepted that the consequences may occur. The last one is probably a bad choice, but it's an option some people say, which is simply rejection. I don't care. I ignore the risk. I deny it exists. I pretend it's not a problem. The problem with rejection of risk is that it is actually considered negligence in court. So if you are sued because something bad happened and you said, yeah, someone told me there was a risk and I didn't care, not that I accepted it. Accepting it is taking responsibility and recognizing the negatives that come from it. But if I just choose to say I don't care, if the risk didn't happen, I don't care, there's no point, hope it doesn't become a problem, that can become a problem in court considered negligence. Handling your risk is something that should always be continuous. You should be continually watching your risk in a situation. It changes over time. Sometimes risk is more or less at given periods of time. You need to be aware of that. Keep an eye on the news. Keep an eye on what's going on in your community. Make sure that your risk doesn't change based on what's going on in the world. So now we start talking about the number benefit. So the cost versus the benefits. How much does the safeguard cost? How much is the, the security control cost? What are the countermeasures? The ability to reduce your risk, so your ARO, your annualized rate of occurrence, can also reduce the severity of damages. It can reduce your exposure factor. So when we put in this risk, my exposure factor goes down, which makes my SLE go down, which changes all of my numbers, and you have to play around with it. So we need to figure out what is the annual cost of the safeguard. If I'm going to hire a security guard, the security guard is going to cost me, I don't know, $50,000 a year. How much do I expect to happen if I don't have the safeguard there? So if I don't have a security guard, I think I'm going to lose $200,000 worth of assets. But if I hire a security guard at $50,000, now I'm good. So that'll decrease that $200,000 of assets to maybe only $50,000 of assets because the safeguard of having a security guard protects from, I don't know, people stealing stuff off of the site. So you take your $200,000 for how much you thought you were going to lose, you subtract the $50,000 you're still going to lose even with the safeguards. Now you have $150,000 loss. You pay $50,000 for your security guard and you have saved the company $100,000 in loss. Playing this numbers game determines whether or not the safeguard is worth it. So you take your ALE, your um, annualized loss expectancy before the safeguard, subtract it post safeguard. So it was $200,000 and it's going to be 50 after we put in the safeguard. So now it's 150. And then we subtract out how much does the safeguard cost us? $50,000 for his salary. And we end up with the $100,000 of the value of the safeguard to the company. If that valuation is negative, it may not be worth it. However, it's never okay to just say we didn't protect it because we couldn't afford it, because we just didn't want to spend the money, because again, you can always come back to that negligence thing. Sometimes you have to, based on governmental rules that say you have to do this whether you can afford it or not. Make sure that you document each of your decisions for each of your asset risk pairings. What is your asset? What is your risk? What was the pairing? What was the cost? What did we come up with? And what was the mitigation we chose? We chose to accept the risk because the ALE pre-safeguard minus post-safeguard minus the cost of safeguard was negative and therefore it wasn't worth it. Or we chose to go ahead and hire the security guard because it was worth it. When you think of the cost of safeguards, it is not just usually a one-time cost. It is the cost of purchasing it. It's the cost of implementing it. It's the cost of annual operations and maintenance. It's the cost of annual repairs, the productivity improvement or loss as time goes on, the changes to the environment, and the cost of testing it and evaluating. Just because you bought something off the shelf doesn't mean it works. You have to test it. You have to make sure it works correctly. A loss of time of your employees to learn the new system. Things like this are, should be included in your cost of your safeguard. Other options we consider are countermeasures. So we want to figure out what is the cost compared to the cost of the asset and benefit of the measure. Does it provide an actual solution? Does it depend on secrecy? In other words, if people know it's there, does it, does it not work anymore? Does public knowledge, because people always find out. 
Is it testable and verifiable? Is it consistent and uniform? And does it depend on anything else? We would like to have countermeasures that have minimal human intervention, that are tamper-proof, that are overridable for approved only, and that they fail safe or fail secure. Remember that fail safe or fail secure. Make sure that if the world ends and it fails, are you able to get out of the burning building or do you get locked out of all of your computers? So there are three different types of countermeasures. We have an asset. Surrounding the asset, we have administrative controls. These are things like policies and procedures or regulations, background checks, things that we do administratively. When you hire someone, you do a background check. That's a type of an administrative control. If you choose not to do a background check, that might not, you know, you might end up with someone in there that you don't want. So background checks help with that. After our administrative controls, we have our logical or technical controls. These are things like hardware, like your routers or your IDS or software that does your encryption and your firewalls, things like this that are going to be using either logical or technical su um, support countermeasures to make sure that you're protected. And then finally, we have our physical control. This is like our guards and our fences and our motion detectors and our alarms and the different things that are physical, tangible in the room that are going to protect our system. Again, using response options, mitigation choices, and countermeasures are all options when you recognize a risk. So you see the risk and you say, what am I going to do about the risk? I'm going to implement a countermeasure like a security guard. That's an option. I am going to not have a building. Everybody's at home and we're going to do everything remote. That's an option if you're worried about people coming on site. If there is no site to come on, you remove that risk. So countermeasures are things that you want to consider to figure out how you want to handle any of these options, administratively, logical, technical, or physical. Next, we have our security controls, and there are seven different types of security controls, and they have different designations, like what are they designed to do? Preventative are designed to stop you. Fences, locks, penetration testing, encryption, they are to stop you from getting in. Deterrence, which we've talked about before, is designed to discourage you. Policies, warning signs, cameras, they're not physically stopping you, but they're designed to convince you not to do this. Detective is designed to discover after the activity has occurred. Again, security cameras or um, IDSs or honeypots where people go in, they do the bad thing, but we have it on camera or we have it on some sort of documentation so that we can go find them later. We are they're designed to discover what happened after it happened. Compensating controls are designed to improve existing controls or in addition to other controls. So we can have a backup that is designed to improve the existing controls of people shouldn't be breaking into the system anyway, or the system could fail, and we're gonna have other ways of fixing that. But we can have compensating ones. Disaster recovery plans are compensating, trying to find a way to improve the existing controls. Corrective controls versus recovery controls are designed to fix the environment after an attack. So your, um, inter, uh, your, your IPSs or quarantining your virus. So you were attacked, we're trying to fix it after the attack, repairing as opposed to recovery, which is designed to restore functionality after the attack. This is your backup drives, your raid drives, your imaging, your shadowing, your hot and cold sites. And then finally, we have our directive controls. These are designed to control the people, to control people coming through. They are policies, requirements, guards, monitoring, supervision, and procedures. Any one of these controls can be used. And again, going back to our NIST documentation in our special publication of 853, this one, as it's listed up here, you can go in there and you can look at the different controls and where they're used in different situations. At this point, we generally do a security control assessment or an SCA, which is an evaluation of the individual mechanisms against a baseline. The point of this is to ensure that the controls are doing what they're supposed to do. Are they effective? Are we having strengths or weaknesses that we can identify of those controls? Essentially, do we have a guard, but he sleeps all the time and no, he doesn't do anything, and so he's not very effective? Or we have cameras, but the cameras are looking the wrong direction. They're not very effective. So you need to constantly be assessing your controls to make sure that they are doing what you need them to do. Next, we want to talk about monitoring. How do you measure whether or not the security control is working? It should be able to be quantified, evaluated, or compared at any given point in time. 
Although it's never an absolute value, it usually gives you degrees of improvement. We want to monitor our events before and after the installation. So we can say this is what happened when there was no security guard. This is what happened after the security guard. So we can identify, did anything good happen now that we implemented that control? Whatever the control was that we put in place, did it get better after we put the control in place or did it get worse? Because if it got worse, then the control isn't working. We need to get rid of the control and do something different. Risk management is all about keeping an eye on it as you go along and making sure that it does what it's supposed to do. So now we're going to talk about risk reporting. So this document here of a risk report is one of the things that you can hand off to a client, to a customer, and say, here are your risks, and these are the things you should do to make it better. So with our risk reporting, this artifact, a risk report, sometimes are mandated by regulatory agencies. You have to do a risk report to show that you are at least putting in the due diligence and the due care to make sure that you are doing things correctly. Risk reports should be accurate, timely, comprehensive, clear and precise, and updated regularly. People tend to do the, I wrote it once and I put it away and I don't care anymore. With your risk register, you want to identify your risk, evaluate your severity and your probability, figure out what the responses are that you think you're going to do, and actually track the progress of those mitigations. The risk matrix here with the likelihood versus the impact is used for qualitative, um, instead of quantitative, qualitative risks. Do What is the impact severity of something occurring and what is the likelihood that it does? So is it certain it's going to happen? It's likely, it's possible, or it's unlikely? And then is it trivial? It's not that big of a deal. Um, it's minor, major, or it's critical, like my entire company goes down. Being able to identify the risk prioritization is going to help you to determine which risks need to be mitigated and which ones can be accepted as they are. So this basic chart graph of a risk matrix or heat map is used to determine qualitative as opposed to quantitative. Quantitative can be done with your asset valuation and your EF and your ARO as you go along there. Important thing about risk management is that you must constantly be improving it. Security is always changing. So enterprise risk management or ERM usually tends to use a risk maturity model, which I've linked below to how to develop a risk maturity model. Similar to our capability maturity model in the fact that we have five different various steps. Our ad hoc, which is essentially starting from no risk management, to preliminary, which is trying, at least each department is trying to do some sort of risk management defined where at least there is a common risk framework standardized across the company. Integrated means that it is part of the basic business process using metrics and then of course benefit of optimized. It's all about achieving your objectives using strategic planning, taking feedback and doing lessons learned. The joke next to it of the comic of Fix yesterday's mistakes, don't make mistakes today, don't make mistakes tomorrow is a great idea, except it's not going to happen. So in the real world, that's kind of hysterical because it's just never going to happen that way. You always need to be aware of legacy devices. So end of life or end of service life. When Windows 7 went out of service, it threw a lot of people off because they didn't prepare for end of life for software. When Windows 8 went out of life. Windows 10 is now being replaced by Windows 11 at this point in time. And what's going to happen when Windows 10 is out of end of life? All of the service updates don't happen anymore and things start to fall apart. And how do we fix those? We don't have updates. We don't have improvements as time goes on. So recognizing the end of support or the end of service life for any of your products that you purchase is part of a legacy issue. Is that a risk? Well, yes, it's going to be end of life in two years. We need to figure that out. Some of the servers people are using, Apache servers, may be out of life. And if they're end of life, you need to find a mitigation option. Buy the new version, figure out how you're going to mitigate that risk. And our last slide on this section is on our frameworks. So recognizing the NIST 837, which again, I've linked here so that you can pull it up and you can grab it is the Risk Management Framework, or RMF. RMF is the main framework for the CISSP exam and for a lot of companies, recognizing the breakdown of how to develop risk management. We categorize, 
grouping based on the impact of the loss. We select our controls. We implement the controls. We assess the controls. We authorize, make the decision to continue to use the controls. And then we continually keep an eye on it with monitoring. And then we go back to categorizing and we keep doing this framework over and over again until the company is no longer a company. Continually looking at the categorization and these controls, how are we going to make sure that they work? Are they working? Keep an eye on them, monitor them, go back. In addition to the risk management framework, which again is probably the one that you want to download and you want to look through. It's a little bit weighty, um, but it is a good framework to be able to recognize. There's a couple of other fr frameworks. The COSO framework, the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations from the Treadway Commission, ISACA's Risk IT Framework, the OCTIV, the Operational Critical Threat, As Threat Asset and Vulnerability Evaluation, Factor Analysis of Information Risk, and the Threat Agent Risk Assessment are other RMFs. You can click on the Additional Frameworks button here and it'll allow you to see those different frameworks and um, how those would work in um, different situations. So you can always look those up. Obviously, they're easy to find online. These are the different frameworks. Thank you for watching this video. I know it was a lot of math and it was a lot of information on risk management. Please come back for the third video in this section on social engineering and we can cover different ways social engineering becomes a risk and how we can mitigate it. Thanks for watching.